If I had the perfect technique for prayer, I would be a rich man. Because I would monetize it. I would, I would sell that technique for prayer. Here's three easy steps for getting the ideal response from God. Here's three easy steps for setting your purposes before Almighty God, the ruler of the universe, and guaranteed, a money back guarantee that God will listen to you and respond to what you want. Here's putting you in the driving seat of the universe. Welcome to Grace Point Presbyterian Church. My name is Kamal. I'm one of the ministers here at the church and I am not a rich man because I don't have the perfect technique for prayer. We are here in the middle of a series on prayer and let me tell you that if you get nothing else from today's engagement with the Bible, nothing else from today's sermon, know this. Prayer is not about technique. Prayer is a deeply relational and personal engagement with the Lord of the universe. And that is why the first thing we need to know about prayer is that we grow in our godliness in and through prayer. Prayer is an act of our conformity to God. It is a renewal of our human nature as image bearers of God, trusting in Almighty God and laying all of our prayers and concerns and needs before Him and rejoicing in Him that He is in the driver's seat of the universe, not us. And therefore, as we begin the second sermon on prayer, it is right that we pray and entrust ourselves to God that He by His Holy Spirit will renew our image in the image of none less than Jesus Christ, his son, the ultimate prayer. But let's pray. Thank you, Father God, that you give to us the privilege of coming before you and laying all of our prayers and concerns and needs before you. We worship you as the almighty God. The whole universe dances to your command, not ours. Therefore, we ask that even during the course of this sermon, will you renew in us an understanding and a love and a comprehension of what it means for us to rely on you, to love you, to joyfully come before you with all of our prayers and concerns, and also to thank you as the God who is in the driver's seat of the universe. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the ultimate one who prays for us. Amen. We live in a secularized world, and secularity is atheist. Therefore, it's all centered on us as humans. We know nowadays that there is no supernatural realm. Therefore, everything is accessible to our human control. Even prayer, therefore, becomes something that is a matter of technique, and that's the problem. We think that prayer is all about just getting the right method of saying the right words and therefore if we happen to get answers to our prayers we are arrogant that we have done this because we have manipulated God by our perfect technique or if we don't more often if we don't get what we pray for we get uh, pray for we get depressed and discouraged because we think that it's all up to us and we do not have our uh, the, the perfect technique all of this is an expression of human technocracy. There's a big fancy word that uh, means that we assume that everything is about human technology. Everything is about technique. We think that we can manipulate people. It's all about educating or re-educating people. If people don't have the right beliefs, if people don't have the right attitudes, then we need to send them for training or re-education. We think we can manipulate people by, by training them and educating them. And if they're too stubborn or stupid to believe what we want them to believe, then we treat them like dumb animals and modify their behavior through rewards and punishment, carrots and sticks, like your pet dog, or if they're even too stubborn to change from that behavior modification, then we can even manipulate the chemistry of their body. We can stuff them full of drugs to change their minds, to change the very way that their mind operates, because under a secularized society where there is no God, where there is no supernatural realm, we know supposedly now that people aren't really people. We're just highly evolved animals. Just we happen to just be intelligent 
tool using, language using animals like any other. We're no, in principle, no different to dolphins or chimpanzees. We, or the chicken you just ate for lunch, or the cockroach that you stepped on. We're just more technological. We happen to be more evolved. We happen to be more advanced. And so who needs prayer? Secularity silences prayer. I mean, we don't even need to pray to people. We don't need to ask people. We can manipulate them to do what we want. We don't need people's consent. So who needs to, if we don't even need to ask politely that people would respond to our needs and requests, who needs to pray to Almighty God? It's all a matter of technique. Manipulating the world to do whatever we want. But of course, we humans are not manipulable like that because we're not just physical beings. Yes, we are biological. If COVID has shown us nothing else, it's shown the significance of our biology and of the vulnerability of our bodies. But we are not just physical matter, putty, biological putty to be molded however we want. We are intelligent, thoughtful, relational, purposeful beings. We make decisions. And we love people and we need love. If COVID has shown nothing else, it's shown us the significance of relationships. We need families. We need connection with people. And especially those of us who are completely isolated are so miserable and so sad. Education and re-education don't always work. Even before COVID, as part of the so-called war on terror, have you noticed how in the USA and England and Europe, People have been lamenting how de-radicalization programs have failed. People who have been like radicalized to be um, terrorists and so on and so on. They tr the governments tried to de-radicalize them through education and it didn't work. That's because we humans image the almighty purposeful relational God himself. God is Trinity. He is love. That's why the Apostle John in 1 John 4 says, God is love. And this God is purposeful. He's got something he's achieving through this COVID pandemic. We don't know what it is, but the fact is he is doing something. Therefore, we humans, God, right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, God creates humans in his image. And we Therefore, image God's purposefulness. Yes, we are embodied. We, we are a biology, certainly. But we are more than merely bodies. Our relate, we are relational beings. We need love, just like God is love. And we are purposeful. We think we are intelligent people who have plans for a future. And therefore, we lament when our plans fall to pieces and we lament because of this COVID, we can't do what we want, we can't fulfill what we desire. There's a, there's a deep truth to that because our plans, our purposefulness is frustrated in our weakness, in our fragility, because we image God, we are not God. And we are lonely, we are sad, we are frightened, we can't see our children, we can't see our, who are living in a different part of Sydney, we can't see our parents who are overseas, we haven't met them for years perhaps, and all of this makes us miserable. Why? Because we are relational. We need love. We want to give love. We want to give a hug, not just see them over Zoom. Therefore, prayer is not merely a matter of technique. Prayer is relationship with the almighty triune purposeful God. Now, how do we get to know someone just here on earth? We spend time with them. And as we get to know them, we conform ourselves to them. If we like them, if we want to spend time with them, if we want to build a relationship with them, we conform ourselves to them little by little, more and more. As we get to know them, we understand what they like. We understand what they don't like. We want to make them happy, so we do what they like. We don't want to irritate them. We don't want to make them sad. So we avoid things that hurt them. And, and that's what 
relationship with God is like. That is what prayer is like. It is deeply growing in our godliness as we get to know God himself personally. And because God is the Holy Trinity, therefore, first of all, getting to know God is in prayer and growing in our godliness in prayer, it means getting to be or understanding ourselves as children of the Father who pray to our Father in heaven, the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6 is in the center of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus himself, God incarnate, teaching us about godliness, what it means for us to live as children of the Father. Okay, And central to being and growing as God's children, children of God our Father, is prayer. The Sermon on the Mount is like the high point, the pinnacle, uh, the, the, sorry, the Lord's Prayer is the high point, the pinnacle of the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, it starts off with our Father in heaven. Well, what does it mean for us to know and grow in prayer as God our Father? It means that His name would be honored. Our Father in he heaven, hallowed be your name. We don't use the word hallow anymore. It means to honor, to exalt, okay? And it, it is to treat God as the ruler of the universe. Your kingdom come, not my kingdom. Technique and manipulation, anthropocentrism. There's another big word. I'm good at using big words, uh, okay? It, the human-centered nature of secularity today means that we think we are in control of everything. For, Growing in God and understanding and praying to God as our Heavenly Father means praying that His kingdom come and so on and so on. One of the best ways of growing in our prayerfulness is to thoughtfully meditate on the Lord's Prayer and to connect that prayer with the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Don't just repeat the Lord's Prayer merely as a routine. We do that every two weeks at Grace Point in order to memorize the Lord's Prayer. But please don't just disengage your mind when you do that. Because that's what Jesus doesn't want us to do. In Matthew chapter 6, in the context of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, don't merely babble like the pagans. That is prayer as technique. The non-Christians, the pagans, the people Jesus was opposing, thought that by their effort, by praying a lot, by uh, dancing around, by singing, by chanting, by feeding their gods, by doing all kinds of techniques, they could manipulate God to do what they want, including just mumbling the Lord's Prayer time and time again. Okay, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's a technique. Don't do the Lord's Prayer like that. Meditate deeply on what it means to love God and grow in our relationship with God and our ability to reflect, to image God as children of the Father. And key to that is praying for our enemies. Because in Matthew chapter 5, if you want to be children of the Father, love your enemies and pray, pray for those who persecute you so that you will be children of your Father in heaven. That was Matthew chapter 5 verses 44 and 45. We can't hate people and pray for them and pray for their good anyway. And we need to pray for our enemies because being children of the Father will give us lots of enemies, will alienate us from people. In the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, the famous Beatitudes, Jesus says, Matthew 5 verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. And why do we need to be peacemakers? Because verse 10, here's an unexpected blessing. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. When you are treated badly for doing the right thing, well done. You are blessed by God. Verse 11, blessed, blessed are you when people insult and persecute you and falsely, when they lie about you because of Jesus. He says, because of me, rejoice, be glad. Yeah, I got persecuted specifically for being a Christian. Therefore, just by naming the name of Jesus and owning our status as children of the triune God, children of the Father, people will hate on us. When they hate on us, pray. Pray for those who persecute you. And do that specifically as children of the Father, children marked by this prayerful dependence on God. And that's going to be peaceful and that's going to be kind and loving and we will show people 
that precisely because we belong to God, we love them. We love those who persecute us. Who does that remind you of? Who is the one who prays for those who killed him, prays even for his enemies? It is Jesus Christ, isn't it? So to grow in our godliness in prayer is to pray to God our Father and show his character even in the content and attitude of our prayers and it is to image God the Son. Jesus is God incarnate and he makes us to be children of God in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, to those who did receive Jesus, verse 12, says the apostle, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. Not born of natural descent, not but born again, to use John chapter 3. Born of God, Galatians chapter 3, in Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. We who are baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. So what does it mean? For us to be Christian, to follow Jesus, it means that God gives us this status of being his children in the name of Jesus, who the God the Son incarnate. Now, how do we grow? How do we become more and more like Jesus? Oh, it's through doing miracles. Well, no. Oh, it's through like preaching and having impact on the world. No, no, no. Romans chapter 8 Verses 28 and 29. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who, who, those who have been called according to his purpose. Those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be firstborn among a, a many brothers. God uses our hardships to make us more and more like Jesus. Because, and that makes perfect sense, because Jesus suffered for the world. He died for his enemies. This is what it is to grow in our godliness and image God and image Jesus Christ, God's Son. It means for us to care for the world, pray for the world, and in this even sort of sacrifice ourselves for the world. We can't literally die for the world to save the world. Only Jesus Christ can do that. But as we image Jesus, God the Son incarnate, we grow more and more like him as we suffer unrighteously, in unjustly, and still care for those who persecute us and suffer with them perhaps even. And we can only do this through God's power. This is not natural. Our selfishness, our self-protection makes us want to make others suffer. We are naturally bullies. We are not naturally people who sacrifice ourselves for others. We would rather make others suffer for us. That's normal. That's more the fruit of the flesh. We are not normally kind and gentle to pray to others. We need God's Holy Spirit. So what does it mean for us to renew the image of God even in and through our prayers to be children of the Father? in the image of God the Son, but we can only do this in the power of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 is the famous uh, fruit of the Spirit, but the context there, first the Apostle Paul says that the acts of the flesh, our normal way of operating, is obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, okay, rage, and so on, and he contrasts that with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. Being fleshly, responding in the normal way, especially in this pandemic lockdown and all the pressures and fears, we're going to show our normal instinctive responses just in the way that we're angry, frightened, that we want to impose all of our ways on everyone all around us. And so it's easy for us to be angry with our family because of all of the pressures of this lockdown. Someone, the kids or husband, wife comes from outside, doesn't wash their hands properly, we hit the roof. Why? Just because we're angry, we're frightened. The kids are bored and restless, running around, tearing things up because they're bored, they're not doing their schoolwork properly. We're so pressured, we get angry. Those of us who are teachers, parents think that we're permanently on holiday. And I've seen on Facebook people whining, why are we even paying teachers? I mean, far out. Don't you feel like reaching through the computer, scheme, uh, the computer screen and punching them on the nose? 
Those of you who are teachers are working really hard day by day to sort of to transfer all of your normal study online and try and give the parents and the children worksheets. Don't they realize how much? It's so easy for us in our fleshliness in our, to respond in a natural way that is angry and divisive and self-centered and self-justifying. We need the miracle of the Holy Spirit. So pray. There is, prayer is an acknowledgement of our vulnerabilities and this COVID pandemic has, has exposed so much of our vulnerabilities. It is right and proper. We image God. We are not God. Part of our image bearing nature is our humility, our limitation. Lay all of this before Almighty God. Do it as a family. Do it on behalf of your non-Christian workmates. More of this next week as we look at approaching the world in prayer. But this is what it means to pray in the Spirit. Ephesians 6 verse 18 has a really interesting little verse. I, and pray in the Spirit on all kinds of occasions with prayers and requests. Now what does that mean to pray in the Spirit? Well, we might think that the Holy Spirit makes us lose control. Oh, you know, I'm, when I'm praying in tongues, that's when I'm praying in the Spirit. Oh, when I'm feeling so wonderful and dancing with um, God himself, that's when I'm praying in the Spirit. Hang on, hang on. In the New Testament, it's the demons that make us lose control. Okay, In Mark chapter 5, it's the legion of demons that make the man do destructive things that he doesn't want to do. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Now, the Spirit, this really needs a whole other series on the work of the Holy Spirit, but just take my word for it for the moment, okay? The Spirit makes Christ-likeness individual to us. He doesn't make us lose control of ourselves. He actually makes us more ourselves. So Kamal is more Kamal, especially when the Holy Spirit takes control of Kamal and in a deep, in a way that is connected with what I want to do. Remember, we as human beings, we image God. We are purposeful. We think we're rational. We make decisions. We are also emotional beings. We want to do things. We love people. God is emotional in the sense that he is love. He pours out his love on us. He is constituted by love. The Holy Spirit makes us fully ourselves and therefore pray and plead with God the Holy Spirit to shape this Christ-likeness in us that we would grow in our imaging of God. And in our particular situation, folks, we are all in such different circumstances. The pressures on us are different. I know that some of us have lost our jobs because of COVID. And so cry out to God that God would give you a sufficient income. The others, others of us, I know that COVID has doubled our workload. It's crazy. And so now some of us are so busy, we're hardly seeing the family, even though we're living at home. We get up early and the kids are still in bed. We lock ourselves in the room, maybe come out for a quick cup of tea, shout at the kids go because we're stressed, go back in the room. By the time we come out, it's nighttime and they've gone to bed. It's nuts. In the pressures and woes and struggles of this COVID pandemic. Cry out to God to show you how can we image God and do good and care for people around us, starting with our families, but even our workmates, our non-Christian friends. How can we even proclaim Christ online in the midst of this COVID pandemic. I'm not just saying that because I'm the missions pastor. Woo, yes I am. And so anything that I say, I can't help but uh, talk about what it means for us to help other people understand Jesus. I'm saying this because the context of where the Apostle Paul talks about prayer in the Spirit, he talks about proclaiming Christ. Look at verses 19 and 20 of Ephesians 6. Pray for me, says the great apostle, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly. Paul is suffering hardship. 
See how normal it is for us to image God in the midst of hardship. This is the point. What does it mean for us to grow in our godliness in prayer? It means for us to trust God, to submit ourselves to God, to grow in our likeness of Jesus, especially in the midst of unrighteous, wrongful suffering for everyone else. Paul went through that and he wants prayer from the Ephesians that he would make Jesus known in the midst of this. This is what it means for us to be, we ourselves will be an answer to Jesus' prayer. Our reading, our Bible reading from John chapter 17, John 17 is the conclusion of Jesus talking to his apostles, his final address to his apostles and giving to them the charge to be the, the early church and teach others in his name and bring others to know him. And right at the end, he prays as the ultimate prayer. This is what I meant right at the beginning when I said Jesus Christ images God by being the ultimate praying person. Do not burden yourselves, dear friends, dear Christians, that you have to be the ultimate intercessor, the ultimate praying person for your family, for the world, for your non-Christian friends and so on. Jesus Christ is the ultimate praying human. Entrust yourself to him and enjoy, rejoice in being the answer to Jesus' prayer. In John 17 verses 20 to 23, Jesus says he's not praying for just the apostles. He's praying for everyone who will believe in Jesus Christ because of their message. That's us. All, however many millions and billions of people throughout the world and throughout history are an answer to Jesus' prayer and he wants all of us to be one, verse 21, just as the Father is in him and he, Jesus Christ, the incarnate one, is in the Father. He wants us to enjoy that internal relationship with God himself. He wants us, the church of God, the people of God, especially in our prayers responding to his prayer, being the answer to his prayer, to image and enjoy and rejoice in the, in the internal, eternal life of God himself. And this is why it's so important that we pray to the biblical Jesus. We can only know Jesus. We can only know God. We can only conform our prayers to God in and through Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 10. A very interesting thing happens at the end of Jesus sending his apostles, his, his people, his disciples out on a mission. Again, can't help myself. I'm the missions pastor. This is where I go. The passage is about mission. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends his disciples on a mission. And when they come back, Luke 10, 21 to 24, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, this was your good pleasure. Now, the word prayer is not in this passage, but here is God the Son incarnate, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, addressing God as Father. It is an act of the Holy Trinity himself, the whole Trinity in prayer because he's addressing God. Now notice that Jesus is full of joy, but he is not enjoying the fact that the apostles have had great success in his name. He is rejoicing in the way that God has made himself known. We can only know Jesus Christ in and as, uh, we can only know God in and as Jesus Christ, God incarnate, verse 22. All things have been committed to me by the Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. No one knows who the Father is except the Son. And those to whom the Son has chosen to reveal him. We can only know God. We can only pray to God. We can only grow in our godliness in the apostolic Jesus, the apostles who knew Jesus and proclaimed him. This is the significance of John chapter 17. The whole Gospel of John, Jesus revealed himself to his disciples and the apostles who wrote the New Testament. Verse 23, coming back to Luke 10, verse 23, he turned to his disciples and said privately to them specifically, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Prophets and kings wanted to see those to whom the son revealed himself. We are dependent on them. That's why we read the Bible. Who needs the Bible? I just pray God will lead me. No, no, nope. Sorry. If the Holy Spirit is working in you, 
then expect to have a deep hunger to know Jesus in and according to the Bible. The Bible is hard work to read, yes, it, but you will want to spend the effort to uh, know, the, know Jesus according to the Bible because we can only know Jesus in and according to the apostolic gospel, the proclamation or, and the inscripturation. That's what the New Testament is. It's the written account of those who knew Jesus personally. So, meditate on the Bible. How do we grow in our godliness? How do we know what God? How can the Holy Spirit individuate God's will to me? How do I know what God wants? Read the Bible prayerfully. And read the Bible communally and then talk about it. This is what our community groups are for. As we read and study... It's so good that we don't just call them Bible studies. We do study the Bible. But we want to grow in our godliness and in our prayerfulness and in our reliance on God and our image of, imaging of God in the midst, in the course of our Bible study. Because it's not just an intellectual activity. Why do we only pray at the end of our community group Bible study time? As we're seeking to know God in scripture and conform our life and pray that God would renew his image in us. Why not pause periodically in your Bible study, your community group study time, and pray that God would bring to life and show me how I can respond to him right here, right now in my particular situation in life. And why do we, like I know in, often in community group, we take the time to share prayer points and then pray for each other. That's a good thing. But in order to save time and just as an expression of how we are together and seeking the face of God and seeking to grow in God, especially in our hardships and suffering during this COVID lockdown, why not just pause and just pour out your heart to God one by one. And as we hear people pouring out our needs and pouring out our joys, thank God we are not ill. Thank you, God, that I've still got a job. I, we're praying for the rest of the hurting world. Just listen and say amen. This is us imaging God, coming to God, especially in our hardships, suffering alongside with others in their hardships. This is what it is to grow in our godliness, in our imaging of God in prayer secularity and the anthropocentric human-centered arrogance of the age makes everything a matter of technique. Theref that even dehumanizes us people because we treat people as mere animals where we can make them dance, where we can stuff drugs into them and make them do what we want. Prayer is a rightful reflection. It is actually, in a sense, the ultimate act of godliness because it is the ultimate act of humility, proper prayer, sort of scriptural, biblical prayer, reflecting Jesus Christ himself, the one who sacrificed himself, who suffered for the world and prays for his enemies. And so rightly, we seek in our prayers, in the act of praying, and in the content of our prayers, we suffer with the world. We suffer with each other. We bring our own suffering and everyone else's suffering to the throne of Almighty God. And so in the name of that Almighty God, and as an act of trying to do everything that I've just been raving on about, let us pray. Father God, we worship you as our Father and we pause to adore and revel in the fact that you invite us, mere cockroaches, mere animals, just humble beings that we are. We are dust in the scale of the universe. Who cares? What, what difference do we make in this, this mighty cosmos that you created? And even in this time of COVID lockdown, we feel so weak and vulnerable. Is the, the COVID virus more evolved than us? Because the whole world is dancing to the tune of the virus. We are not in control of the virus. But we worship you as Almighty God, who even and especially as the Almighty King of the universe, you invite us to call you Father. That is amazing. 
and we worship you, Jesus Christ, the incarnate one who died and rose for us. Even if God calls us to be father, we are wicked children who run away from God, who spit in the face of God. But you, Jesus Christ, God the Son, you became human. You know what life is like. You suffered all kinds of things, even before your ultimate passion, your death on the cross, to reconcile us enemies. That's amazing. We worship you. And now you are risen. And it is only because of your prayers that my prayers and any of these prayers can come before God our Father. That is amazing. And then how much more amazing can, will it ever stop the wonder of imaging you and approaching you in prayer that Holy Spirit, you dwell in me, you dwell in us corporately, you cannot be locked down, you are mighty and powerful and at work in the world and at work in us and even in our prayers. You take our prayers to the throne of Almighty God. This is amazing. God, we could spend all of our days, all of our minutes simply adoring you for the privilege of prayer itself. But for the sake of everyone watching this live stream and the sake of time and the need of needs of our families, I now pray very briefly and simply, will you renew the image, your image, in us, in the content and the act of prayer? Show us what it means for us to, show, to be children of the Father. Show us what it means to bear the image of the Son. Holy Spirit, bring forth the fruit of godliness, of Christ-likeness in us. As we pray, and as we pray for the world, as we pray for our families and ourselves, this is my prayer for Grace Point, for, ev for everyone watching this live stream, for your church across the world, for this whole hurting world. By the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one, to God our Father. Amen.